Hello! Uh, hi everyone, I'm John, and uh, thank you for being here for this oboe maintenance, repair, seminar, masterclass, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be here. I appreciate you stepping away from uh, your game of Animal Crossing for a few minutes. I'm sure your island will be totally fine. No one is going to sneak onto it and chop down all your trees. It's, it's fine. It's fine, right? It's fine. Um, I wanted to do this seminar, first of all, to give myself uh, something productive to do with my time because business is a little slow right now. Non-essential businesses here in Pennsylvania are closed to the public. And I also wanted to give musicians out there, hopefully you folks, uh, some information on how to keep your oboe maintained in good working order while you may not be able to get it to a shop if something goes wrong or maybe you're not in a position to be spending money on keeping it maintained at this time. So we want to we want to do whatever we can to, to keep it working. Uh, in a few minutes we're going to talk about some really basic repair stuff for specific situations that you might run into, uh, mostly mechanical issues with uh, specific keys, and I'll try to walk you through diagnosing and addressing those problems. Stuff that you might encounter on your own instrument or if you uh, especially if you're someone who teaches young kids, if you have a, a studio or maybe you're a band director, um, and issues that you might encounter with their instruments or that they might encounter with their instruments. Um, so we'll probably get to that in, you know, about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, before that, we're going to talk about maintaining your instrument, how that can help prevent problems from arising in the first place. And we'll talk about the importance of uh, getting your instrument professionally maintained. Um, we're going to skip over obvious stuff, uh, things like how to use a swab. Um, if you are looking for that kind of information, I just recently uploaded a series of videos on this YouTube channel about maintaining various different band instruments uh, that are more directed at high school students, parents of younger students uh, for band directors to distribute. So if you're looking for that, uh, there's a playlist of that here on the channel that you can uh, check out if it if that interests you. Um, but, you know, the stuff we're going to be talking about here are, are topics that are more relevant to advancing players, maybe college students, adults. Like I said, if you're uh, someone who teaches oboe, either to a studio or, or to, uh, to maybe a band or, or orchestra students. Um, so we're going to get to that in, in just a moment. Before I get to that, I do want to take a moment here at the top to point out there's a link uh, in the description. The very first link in the description is to sort of a, a virtual tip jar. Um, if you are able and inclined and you want to chip in a couple bucks to um, sort of offset the, the cost of putting this on, which is really just, you know, the time that I invested in it, uh, I would certainly appreciate it. If you're not in a position to do that or you just don't want to, that's totally fine. Um, economics should not be a barrier to anyone getting this information. This recording, a recording of this will be up after tomorrow and, you know, it will remain free forever for as long as YouTube exists. Um, if you do choose to, to chip in a few bucks, though, know that half of whatever you contribute will go to an organization called Play on Philly, which provides free, intensive after-school music lessons to students at several schools in the, in the city of Philadelphia. And I've been doing work for them for a number of years. They recently started an oboe studio at one of their schools, and I've been donating some work on those instruments. So I thought it would be appropriate to sort of share whatever comes in with them. Um, so if you're able to do that, great. If you would rather just make a donation directly to them, that's totally understandable. There is also a link in the description to go straight to their donation page and just give 100% of a, of a donation to them. So. Uh, with all that said, we're going to uh, transition to talking, let's talk about maintenance. And um, the, the first thing I wanted to dive in on is something that everyone agrees on, uh, universal uh, consensus on oiling the wood of your oboe. Of course, that's a lie. Uh, nobody agrees on that. And if you, if you spend any amount of time uh, researching online, trying to find information about oiling your oboe, you will find uh, dozens of different opinions um, shared by people with varying levels of forcefulness and factuality. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind that the person who yells the loudest is not necessarily always the one who has the best information. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the theory behind oiling your instrument. Why? 
why it's something we do, when and when we don't do it. I'll start at the top here by saying um, you can oil the wood of your oboe, you can oil the bore, but it's something that should be done with the, the right information, the right equipment, and uh, sort of with a plan. So uh, not necessarily a good idea to just start oiling your oboe uh, tomorrow because it's something you feel like you should do. Um, I'm going to switch the cameras here really quick uh, so that we can, uh, so that you can get a view of my bench as well. Let's see. And whoops. Oh, ah. um, that's the one. That's the one. Here we go. And you're going to enlarge the bench view so you can see it a little better. And I will just be up here in the corner. So, uh, oiling your instrument, what, what, is, what is the purpose of it? Um, you know, one piece of information you will often see is that uh, you oil the instrument to hydrate the wood. And that's sort of a misnomer. Uh, because the only way to hydrate a piece of wood is with moisture or, uh, you know, with water. Um, so oiling the instrument doesn't necessarily hydrate it, but what, what the oil does is it regulates the level of humidity, the level of moisture in the wood. So, you know, when a piece of wood is still a tree before it's cut down, it produces oils and sap and things. and once it's cut down, it stops producing those things, and over time the oil will dry out uh, and, and the wood will become dry. So to, to combat that, we, we oil it. And you, you have to imagine the, a piece of wood, a, you know, a wooden instrument, that uh, it's, it's, it's constantly having moisture pushed into and pulled out of it, right? Because the humidity in the air varies and humidity seeks equilibrium. So mo the, the moisture wants to go in and out of an instrument to make sure that the, the level of humidity inside of it is the same as the level of humidity outside of it or, or in the air. So if you can imagine a, a, you know, a, a piece of wood, an upper joint of an oboe, for instance, that uh, has no oil in it and you, you maybe take it out of the case, you're in sort of a, a cooler, maybe drier environment, and you start blowing warm, moist air into the bore of the instrument. What's gonna happen is that that wood is going to wanna soak up as much of that humidity as it can as quickly as possible to try to achieve that equilibrium. And what happens when, when it does that? As, as that water, that moisture goes into the wood, into the pores and into the grains of the wood, it, it has to go somewhere, so that inner bore is going to expand, right? And if the outside of the instrument is still cool and, and a little dry, it doesn't want to move. So as the inner bore expands and expands, the outer bore, the, uh, the outer wall, excuse me, wants to stay where it is, and eventually something has to give. That outer wall is going to have to move, and that's how we get cracks. So by infusing oil into the pores and, and the grain of the wood, it makes the water molecules work a little bit harder to, to get into the wood. They can't pass in as easily and as quickly if, if they have to move past all of these oil molecules that are taking up space. So we still want the wood to be able to respond to changes in humidity. We want, we want moisture to be able to move in and move out of the wood as conditions change, but we want to be able to regulate how that happens. We want to slow down how that happens so that the wood isn't moving too quickly. And that's, that's what the oil does. Uh, you know, a few other things that, that are beneficial about slowing down that process of, of wetting and drying, as we might call it, is, you know, the more that happens, the more the wood expands and contracts and expands and contracts, you can get things like, you can get changes in the dimensions of the wood. So you, you might get uh, tone holes that turn slightly oval, which is it's something that you, you sometimes see if you work on enough um, wooden instruments. Another thing is that if, if wood is dry, it's very brittle, so you can get chipping. 
And obviously we want a smooth surface in the bore. Any sort of chipping in the bore is, is going to have a detrimental effect on the performance of the instrument. And you know, uh, the last thing is that if the wood is sucking up a lot of water very quickly and holding that water, then that creates an ideal environment for things like mold and fungus, a dark, wet, warm environment. And that's how you get rot. So oiling the instrument helps us to to m maybe not completely prevent any of these things from ever happening, but it certainly m mitigates them and it, it lowers the chances that some of those things are going to happen. So um, as I said, oiling is, it's something you can do, but but you want to make sure you, you have the right information um, and, and you want to make sure you have the right equipment and the right oil. If you were to uh, go into an average music store, let's say, and uh, pick up a, a bottle of big name brand uh, valve oil, uh, excuse me, bore oil, then uh, what it's usually going to be is what's called mineral oil, the, the same stuff that baby oil uh, is, is made from. Maybe it might have a few additives in it, but that's basically what it is. Um, that is not necessarily a great material for us to be using to oil wood it's a little more water repellent than than the other oils we might consider using um, and it's, it's very thin and it, it just doesn't really provide sort of the conditioning that that the wood might need so most uh, most technicians um, or at least are in agreement that using some sort of nut or fruit oil uh, is ideal you know these these oils, uh, organic oils, as we would call them, uh, have somewhat different properties from mineral oils or oils that, that are distilled from petroleum. So um, we use those for those reasons. And, um, you know, every, every technician is typically going to have their own formulation uh, that they use. The uh, sort of the most popular and most agreed upon base oil is almond oil, sweet almond oil. And you can just use that uh, straight as an oil in your oboe. Um, there used to be a product called Nailers Bore Oil, N-A-Y-L-O-R-S, and that was really popular among a lot of technicians. Um, a lot of people really liked it. Unfortunately, the, the gentleman who made it, Larry Naylor, who was a technician out in Colorado, passed away a few years ago. And uh, it, as far as I can tell, that, that product is no longer available. So people are you know, sort of having to resort to, to making their own concoctions, formulations. There's another popular product called Doctor's Grenadilla Oil, which apparently is made from the oil of a grenadilla tree. I don't know how you extract oil from grenadilla, but apparently they found a way to do it. And um, they sell it in a, a tiny little vial. It's quite expensive, but, you know, it seems to make sense that that would be, um, that would be an, an ideal product to use, the oil that came from the, the Grenadilla wood originally, what would have been in it if it were still a tree. So um, what I use, I use a, a formulation that's mostly a sweet almond oil. It's actually not my recipe, so um, I, I am not comfortable sharing exactly the, the formulation of it, but, um, but it, you know, it's mostly almond oil. It has a little bit of orange oil in there for, for flavor, if you will. And um, if you're if you're thinking about oiling your instrument you know a good idea to maybe have a conversation with your technician about a schedule um, how frequently should you be doing it should it be once a year a few times a year once a month maybe every few years a lot of these things depend on how frequently you play how intensely you play the conditions in which you live the age of your instrument and how it's been cared for um, all of these things can can influence how frequently an instrument should be oiled um, you know, typically when I get an instrument in for a tune-up, I just take a look down the bore and see if if it looks like it's dry, I'll, I'll oil it. Uh, if it looks okay, and I know I'm going to be seeing that instrument again before, you know, uh, the next decade, then then I'll, I'll send it out the door and, and let it ride, and then we'll take another look at it the next time it comes in. Uh, there there are some guides out there for how to, to oil your bore. Um, you know, the thing about 
oiling an elbow is you can't, there's only so many things you can use to oil the upper joint because you can't really use a rod with a cloth on it. It won't fit through the top of the joint. Um, what a lot of people use is a feather. And if that's something you're going to do, you know, best advice I can give you is use a sparing amount of oil, uh, as little as you can, spread it around on the bore, on the inside of the bore, and then allow it plenty of time to absorb. I think a, a mistake that a lot of people make is they'll wipe that bore oil onto the inside of the instrument, let it sit for a few minutes or a few hours, and then wipe it right back out. And the instrument really hasn't gotten any positive effect from that. So, you know, at least 24 hours uh, is, is a good measure. More if you can to, to just allow it to, to sit and absorb that oil and then swab it out before you start playing. Um, I have a, a couple resources here that I'm going to try to switch over to. There we go. Um, so this is a, a website of a guy in uh, England, uh, shwoodwind.co.uk, and he has this really nice uh, extensive article about bore oiling, a lot of the stuff that, uh, that I just said, and uh, he talks about different types of oil. And he has a technique here for doing it. Now, of course, his technique is more applicable to clarinets, which have a larger bore. Um, but there's a lot of good information there if that's if it's something that you're that you're curious about and interested in. And and again, I would advise that it's best to talk to a technician before starting an oiling regimen for your instrument. Um, one other set of resources here, <clears throat> that guy Larry Naylor, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago. This is uh, the website for his business, which uh, I don't believe the business is operational anymore. But he has a few publications here that are, uh, are of interest. One, Deterioration of Grenadilla Instruments, uh, about the breakdown of Grenadilla wood. And then Life Everlasting for a Good Clarinet is all about oiling. It, it has um, it's tons of information that he gleaned over a long career of working on instruments and observing and taking notes. Um, these are long articles, but they are really worth a read. There's, there's a whole bunch of information in there. If you are interested in that, I would advise you to uh, visit his website as soon as possible to, uh, to download these articles. Parts of his website appear to be dying. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much any of this is going to remain up. I, so if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description to, to go to this website and, um, and see you know all of these publications and uh, if you have a little bit of time, as many of us do right now, uh, you know, they're worth the read. So, here, hey, I'm back. <clears throat> um, the last thing I'll say about oiling is, is again, um, just a caution about some of the advice that's out there that you'll see if you, uh, if you spend any amount of time on a, on a woodwind forum, which is uh, some people will advocate using linseed oil, <clears throat> boiled or raw linseed oil. And um, we don't really advocate that. We, we don't recommend that. And the reason is that linseed oil is what's called a drying oil. It will, um, as it dries, it will leave a coating wherever it is that's impervious to water. And if you're under the impression that the purpose of oiling the instrument is to seal the bore, then that kind of makes sense, right? You would, you would want to have an impervious layer to prevent water from getting into the wood. But as we just discussed, that's not really the purpose of oiling. You don't want to seal the wood. You want it to be able to, to breathe and absorb and release moisture. So uh, linseed oil, for that reason, is, is really not ideal for our purposes. And if, if, it, if it does get coated on the inside of your board, it can be difficult to remove it so that we can then you know, oil it with, with a more appropriate oil and allow that oil to actually get to the wood. Um, we do use linseed oil on bassoons sometimes, but because bassoons are made of maple and, and maple has, has different properties uh, and different needs, it's the, the needs for a bassoon are, are not necessarily uh, what we need for an oboe. So that's my little uh, manifesto, I guess, on oiling. Um, and uh, the... Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, sorry, I'm looking at my little script here. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is humidifying. You know, we talked about how oiling isn't necessarily meant to humidify, but you, you may want to humidify your instrument, especially if you are traveling between uh, areas with different, uh, different environmental conditions. If you live in an area where you have cold, dry winters, 
Um, and the, the most uh, famous, uh, I guess, uh, way of humidifying an oboe, the, the traditional way, is with orange peels, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. But, uh, you know, you just take an orange peel, stick it in your case, a few pieces of orange peel, wait till they dry out. When they dry out, take them out, throw them away, and put in some, some new pieces of orange peel, and that'll just, you know, keep that humidity level in your case up so that you're not taking out a dry instrument every time you play and blowing that warm, moist air into it. Um, another effective little tool is, uh, is one of these guys. This is called a humistat, and it's very simple. It's just a you know, plastic tube that you fill with water. There's a sponge on this end. You can turn this dial to expose more or less of it, and, uh, and in that way, you know, give more or less humidification to your case. Uh, some people also use a damp it, which um, is just a, it looks like a long piece of usually green rubber. Uh, guitar players uh, are fond of them. And uh, there's, it's just a sponge in that piece of green rubber. So you, you soak it, you stick it in your case, and then over time as it dries out, it releases moisture into the case. So, um, you know, sort of a, a two-pronged approach to, to caring for the wood on your instrument, right? right? Keeping it, make sure, making sure that it, it's oiled, uh, properly and, and with the right products and then making sure that it, it has the humidity that it needs to to stay in good shape. Um, I forgot to mention this up top but there is a live chat so if you have a question um, please feel free to post them as we go. Uh, if you um, you know if if you want to wait till the end to post questions that's fine if you don't have questions that's fine too. Um, just be aware uh, there's a little bit of a delay between when I say something and when you see it so if you post a question I won't get to it instantaneously, but I'll try to get to them uh, as we go. Um, just want to make sure I have the live chat enabled. Yes, I do. Okay, good. So, talk about oiling and humidifying, and you know those are two the two big important parts of conditioning the wood and preventing cracks. And I want to talk a little bit about cracks. Um, how to identify a crack? Um, what what sort of behaviors from your instrument might indicate that that you've encountered a crack? Um, so, uh, there, there, the upper joint is is where you're most commonly going to see cracks, obviously, uh, and probably the most common place we see them is starting here, uh, from the what's called the the well for the lower octave key, um, and then traveling down. Often we'll see it travel through the two trill key tone holes and then through the half hole tone hole. Uh, and the reason that it travels through those is because they're, you know, they're big holes in the wood. They're sort of a weak spot. So it's easy for a crack to exploit that and travel straight through the tone hole and then continue on. Um, the, the well here, here I have a, uh, there we go. This is what the well looks like without any keys or, or, or the uh, vent inside it. So the well is just, you know, a big threaded piece of metal that's sunk into the body. And, you know, part of the reason we often will see cracks starting here is that this piece of metal, this large piece of metal, is first of all through a big hole in the body. And the metal and the wood are going to tend to expand and contract at different rates and respond to changes in temperature and humidity differently. So if the wood contracts more quickly than the metal, the metal's not going to move, the metal's not going anywhere. So the, if the wood wants to contract, it has to go somewhere and so it will, it will split, it will open up on either side of that well uh, and, and start a crack. So if, you know, a sign that you might have a crack, uh, especially one that's just starting, is maybe you, you get your instrument out, you start playing it, it plays fine for a few minutes, and then as it gets warmer, excuse me, as, as you play more, that crack is going to start to open up, right? And so you might notice that you're having to work harder, you're having to move more air, the responsiveness is down, it just feels leaky. Um, and, and that would be an indication that you, you have a crack that's, that's maybe just starting. Um, and, you know, like I said, a, a good place to usually check is, is right there. Usually at the top half of the upper joint is where we're going to see cracks uh, most commonly. Um, so, you know, they can happen above this octave well, you know, somewhere up in this area. Um, 
but you know, like I said, between these two points, the 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 half hole vent and the lower octave uh, well is where we see the most often. If you if you see that you have a crack and maybe you're in an emergency situation, you don't know what to do, you have to play your instrument. Sometimes you can get away with uh, using some clear nail polish to to just cover it. Um, just spread it on and allow it to dry. It's obviously not a permanent solution, but it may it may hold enough of a seal that you'll be able to get through a performance or something or a rehearsal, um, and and then be able to get it to a technician to have it to have it sealed. Um, your technician may take a number of different approaches to to dealing with that. They may just just glue it. Uh, they may pin it. They may band it. Um, if they pin it, they might use steel pens, they might use carbon fiber pens, you know, it all depends on each crack and, and sort of how it behaves. Um, if you if you have a crack that goes through these tone holes, the trill key tone holes here, often what we'll have to do is drill those out and uh, install a plastic insert that, uh, that will prevent that crack from reopening and, and leaking sort of around the pad. So, um, you know, if you keep a, if you can keep a bottle of, if you are worried about cracks happening and you can keep a bottle of clear nail polish in your case, it just, it might save you. It might not, but you know, it's, it's worth a shot. It's easy for a technician to remove that stuff uh, when you bring it into the shop if, if, if you're, uh, if you definitely do have a crack there. Um, sometimes what we'll see is that as a crack is just starting, you know, like I said, the crack will usually start from the outer wall of the instrument because it, it's the inside of the instrument is trying to expand faster than the outer wall. So sometimes we'll see a crack that, you know, you can see it uh, from the top of the instrument, but it hasn't spread all the way through to the bore. So what will appear as a crack, and, and certainly is a crack, um, may not actually be leaking at first. And, and if you're fortunate enough to see it before it starts giving you problems, then that's a great signal to, to get it into the shop as soon as you can and get it, uh, get it taken care of. Um, next thing I, I want to talk about is water in uh, in tone holes um, something that I'm sure any every oboist has experienced <clears throat> um, you know usually happens because there's some sort of buildup in the tone hole um, water water loves a rough surface to to adhere to and and kind of beat up on a perfectly smooth surface makes it really tough for for the water to beat up so um, you know if you look at the if you are looking at the inside of a tone hole. Where's my flashlight? Um, you know, you can see this is a low E flat tone hole on this English horn, and uh, there's a nice smooth surface on the inside there. No, no buildup, no gack. I just cleaned and oiled uh, this instrument as part of an overhaul. So, um, you know, that's the surface we want to have inside the tone holes, especially on the upper joint. It's not uncommon to find a lot of buildup, um, especially in the three mainline keys. You know where your fingers are resting on them, there's a hole through the middle, gunk can kind of move in and out. So it's it's not uncommon to have water issues there. The the permanent fix is of course to take your instrument in, you know, get it cleaned. If you're comfortable taking it apart and you want to go in there and clean out the tone holes yourself with a Q-tip or something, great. Um, <clears throat> but you know, getting it in ideally to a shop and getting them to take it apart and clean it is the permanent solution to that. You know, in the short term, there's always um, there's always cigarette paper, the old standby, and um, what uh, you know aside from just sticking it under the pad, boy, if I could, you know, in the moment you would stick it under the pad, maybe tap it, maybe you know plug up the rest of the joint and blow through to try to clear that water out. Um, but then when you put your instrument away in the case. You can slip that uh, a fresh piece of cigarette paper under the pad, um, and and it can sometimes help wick some of that moisture out while while it's in storage while it's drying out. You know, in the case, um, it works especially well on closed pads. So you know, the two small pads here on the uh, other joint, you can just slip that piece of cigarette paper under there and just leave it in your case like that. You could also use a microfiber, something like that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, also a common problem on the trill keys and the same thing. You can um, you can stick that cigarette paper or, or something else under there to, to try to wick a little bit of that moisture out. Uh, I want to show you what, um, you know, sort of 
the part of the reason that we get water in those octave pips. So this is uh, this is an octave pip or an octave vent, as we might call it. So this this is what threads into the well here. Oh, there it is. Threads into the well, and then is actually the hole through which the your octaves will vent. Um, so when it threads into the well here, there's there's a little space at the bottom uh, between the the bottom of the the vent there and the bottom of the well. And I actually have one here that is sort of cross sectioned, so you can see that. So this is one that this is a well and a vent from a not super great oboe that I uh, I uh, you know put them together and then filed off half of it to expose what what the sort of cross section looks like and I'm going to pull up here a uh, whoops I'm going to pull up a, a better picture of that so you can see it a little more closely um, so this is this is a cross section of the vent so here's the actual hole that air passes through when you when you press your octave key here's where the the pad sits pad sits against this seat up here <clears throat> and then the bottom you know this this sits against the the bottom of the actual hole in the wood um, I'll show you that in a second so you can see this is the bottom of the vent and then this is the actual well that it threads into and there's a fairly sizable space here where if there's any sort of buildup gunk corrosion um, mineral deposits in there that gives water a great place to to beat up and then the only way out is up right if, if you're blowing air through that water is going to want to just follow that air straight up and out so um you know when when an instrument comes into the shop for service we would we would remove the vent from the well and then get into the well with a q-tip or something um maybe some solvent clean things out um, i'm going to switch back to to the bench view here <clears throat> and uh you know, uh, typically we'll we'll take the vent itself and clean it in solvent. I, I will I use a little vial of acetone and just drop it in there and let it kind of sit and let all of the stuff that's on it dissolve over maybe a few days if if needed. Um, and then you know once everything is is clean, we'll make sure that the hole through the middle is clear, and then reinstall it uh, in the in the body, seal it, and then usually. By doing that, we can we can mitigate that problem. Um, I said I would show you. <clears throat> this is the the actual. Whoops, there it is. Uh, so this is that not super great oboe that I took this well out of. And uh, so this is the actual hole in the body. That the well the well goes into that, and then the vent goes into the well. Usually, uh, this would be threaded, so the well screws in. Um, this is a not super great oboe, so they didn't bother threading it. It just sort of pressed in there and was uh, held in place with shellac but you can see there's you know there's a bottom to this hole that the well sits against um, it doesn't go straight through and then uh, and then you know that's that's where your your octaves come out <clears throat> um, if you uh, if you've never seen an octave vent remover this is what it looks like um, it's got these two prongs on the tip this one is adjustable so there's two little uh, there's two little sort of nubs in the top of the vent. I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but uh, there's one and there's one. So you know the tool fits in those, and then that's how we that's how we unthread it or, or thread it back in. <clears throat> um, this is another one I made just from a. This is a a, a chunky interchangeable bit screwdriver, and this is just one of the flathead bits from it that I took and I grind it away a lot of it with the Dremel tool to make a to make a little octave remover obviously this one isn't adjustable but you know it works in a pinch uh, if my other one breaks I have an option so um, so that's you know sort of the the reason we see problems in octave keys um, sort of how we would deal with them you know like I said if you if you're encountering that problem and you want to stick that cigarette paper under there while it's in the case it can help it can help to wick some of that stuff out. Um, another issue you'll you'll frequently have with octave keys, especially, is that they stick uh, from time to time, especially the lower octave key, because it's just activated by a little spring under here. 
Um, again, cigarette paper is useful here. You know, you stick it under, you drag it through with the key closed to try to pick up any corrosion, any green stuff that might be holding it down. Um, <clears throat> can also use a, this is stuff that I got from a, a technician in Canada, a guy named Jan Bunetta, who, uh, he works on trumpets, but, uh, but he discovered this stuff that works really well. It's, uh, it's called Pellon Fusible Interfacing. If you do like, um, like sewing crafts, you might be familiar with it. I, I think you use it for like, you put it between two pieces of material that you need to sew together and then you iron it and it sort of melts and holds them together for a while. So, um, it's like a, it's like a non-woven polyester fabric, but it's, uh, it's, it has a little bit of abrasion to it, so it seems to work really well for getting in there and grabbing that stuff and pulling it uh, off of the pad and off of the, the tone hole or the van or whatever it may be. So uh, P-E-L-L-O-N -L -L is the brand name, Fusible Interfacing. I'm sure if you just look up Fusible Interfacing, you can get, you probably get 100 yards of this stuff for a few bucks, um, but really useful. <clears throat> um, so uh, let's see. Okay, no big questions. Oh, somebody asked, how often do you oil? Like I said, it, it really depends on the instrument. Um, it's it's totally dependent on, on so many different factors that it's good to talk to a technician or, or a trusted resource um, to sort of come up with a schedule if you want to do it yourself or, or to have them do it for you when, when you bring your instrument in for maintenance. Um, okay, uh, just a couple other maintenance things, and I'm going to talk about some repairs. Uh, swabs versus feathers. Uh, I, this is the the eternal debate in the oboe community. Do you swab your instrument out with a, with a swab, a silk swab, or with uh, with a turkey feather? And I've I've used both. I think both are totally acceptable. Um, you know, it's it's whatever you feel comfortable using. The only thing I would say, two things. Uh, one, if you're going to use a swab make sure it has a, it's a double-ended swab. So it has that little string coming out the bottom end so that if it does happen to get stuck in the upper joint, you can pull it out through the bottom of the joint. Uh, I'm sure, you know, all, all, many if not all of us know you should never try to pull a stuck swab up through the top of the, of the joint. Um, so that, that's, you're taking good care of that feather, replacing it when it needs to be replaced um, so that it's not shedding into the case. It's not leaving all sorts of fibers and stuff that can get into your mechanism. Um, so, you know, but beyond that, you, you do you, I'm a do me. Um, oiling the mechanism is, is something that you might be inclined to do. You know, when you bring your instrument into the, into the shop, um, especially if it's been a while, we might take the, take the instrument apart, um, oil it, and, uh, you know, clean out all of the the gunk from the, the rods and screws, and then we'll put fresh oil on, put everything back together. Um, but if you want to do that without having to take your instrument apart, if you just, you know, you're concerned about um, about the the oil in there drying out, <clears throat> um, first of all, get yourself a good quality key oil. This is this is nice stuff uh, that I like. Hetman, um, all of their oils are numbered, so medium key oil is good middle of the road key oil number 17 they make a light and they make a heavy um, heavy would be if your instrument is old and and the mechanism is a little clanky uh, light would be if the key fitting is especially tight like if you've just had it overhauled or something um, <clears throat> and you know the, the way you the way you would uh, oil is just to take the little needle tip here and place it at every junction point so anytime a key meets a post or two keys run up against each other, you can see those. Just put a little drop of oil in each spot and then work the keys. Um, you know, on the upper joint here, you wanna make sure you're opening those two small keys so that oil gets distributed. You do that by pressing on the bridge key back here. And, you know, that will allow that oil to sort of move into the mechanism. Obviously, it's not going to be as thorough as taking the whole thing apart and uh, and applying oil directly to the steel rod that goes through here and and then reinstalling it but you know it'll it'll at least help it, it can't it can't possibly hurt um, the nice thing about using an oil like this a synthetic oil is that it lasts a long time it doesn't dry out uh, it doesn't evaporate and leave like any sort of <clears throat> uh, sediment behind that could gum up the mechanism and it it seems to not really react with other oils 
if you're using maybe two different types of uh, of of uh, mineral oils, you know, petroleum distillate oils, you know, sometimes they can react with each other and, and cause problems. It's not common, but it can happen. Uh, but this synthetic stuff really does uh, seem to not react with anything. It doesn't cause those problems. Um, and I, I, my, my, my friend Matt here just commented, less is more on key oil. And that's absolutely true. You don't want key oil, you know, flooding out of the mechanism all over the place. <clears throat> Something I forgot to mention is when you do, after you work those keys around for a few minutes, make sure everything is well distributed. Take a, just take a cloth and wipe the mechanism off. <clears throat> Get all that extra oil off of there. Um, yeah, go grab some water real quick. <clears throat> That's better. <clears throat> the the reason we oil the keys is to uh, is to create a barrier between the steel rod that runs through here and the 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 tube on the key itself, which on a professional level instrument is typically going to be made of silver. Um, here is a, it's just a rod and a key for illustrative purposes. Here's the G key from uh, an old Kabart oboe that I have here and rod just goes through there. You know, it's a hinge. It just rides on that rod. So by putting a layer of oil between the rod and the key, then we, we reduce the amount of friction between the two. Friction causes wear, wear causes play in the keys, slop in the mechanism. And slop in the mechanism means that pads aren't always able to meet their tone holes in the exact same position every time you push a key down, because if that key is able to move back and forth or wobble a little bit, that's, that's an inconsistency. Um, so over time, if, you're, if your instrument isn't getting oiled, if it's not getting maintained, if the fit of the keys isn't being checked on a somewhat regular basis by a technician, you get wear. Um, this is this is my oboe, which uh, I never work on because nobody pays me to work on it. So um, it's a it's a clatter trap. It's kind of a disaster. But <clears throat> you can see how loose that side F key is there. How much back and forth play there is in that mechanism. You know, it's a short hinge. It's a long key, so there's a lot of force that's applied. To, to this small contact area. So because I haven't properly maintained this key, I haven't fit it, um, it's, it has a lot of play in it. So you can imagine that if you have that throughout the mechanism of the instrument, then you're gonna have a lot of inconsistencies in the way it responds and the way it behaves as you're playing. So, you know, oiling is one way that we can sort of prevent that from becoming a major issue. Um, so that is uh, that is sort of maintenance, the whole maintenance part of the, the discussion. The one other thing I did want to mention just very briefly is, um, is the case, is case maintenance. Your instrument spends most of its life in its case. So, you know, make sure that the, the case itself, the nesting is in good shape. That, uh, you know, it's not like this. That's broken that the, the wood that holds the instrument isn't broken. It, you want it to be held nice and securely so it's not flopping around in the case. And if you have these nice French hinges that everyone has on their robo cases that sometimes seem to come pre-broken from the factory, um, get them replaced. You don't want to you don't want to have an incident where your instrument falls out of its case. These are replaceable. Many shops will will have them in stock and be able to replace them. So you know take good care of your case. It's it's your instrument's home. Keep it clean. Keep it working. All right. So all of that uh, is sort of the maintenance part of the presentation. And I'm going to talk a little bit here about uh, some, uh, some repairs. Took longer than I expected. Sorry. Thank you for sticking around. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I just want to talk about some common issues, specific things that might come up that you, you might have a need to address, again, either with, with your instrument or maybe a student's instrument. Um, we're going to talk about a few regulation issues. You know, I would love to be able to go through the entire instrument and go through every regulation point so that you can, you can go through and set that all up yourself. But um, it's, it's just not something that we really have the time for. It's, it's difficult to do uh, over the internet like this. So 
we're going to talk about a few a few issues that, that come up most frequently. Uh, the first one, I'm going to put this together. First one, uh, especially common on student level instruments, is with this arm that regulates the F sharp to the G sharp. Uh, so you know what's supposed to happen is if I'm holding open the G sharp key with my pinky here, and I press down the F sharp key. Uh, this arm is supposed to close both of them, so they both close and seal at exactly the same time. You can see I was using this one for a demonstration the other day, and there's a little bit of play there. It's not holding the G-sharp key closed all the way. <coughs> um, it's, it's really, not really common, but it's somewhat common for, for this arm to get bent down. And, th and the reason for that is that it sticks out above the top of the lower joint here. Um, so as you're as you or your student are putting it, putting the instrument together, it can snag on maybe the G sharp touch piece there, or you know it could get bumped into something, snag on a piece of clothing, um, get damaged in an oboe sword fight, any number of things. So what we'll commonly see is is that'll get bent down, and then the the symptom is you'll be able to play the upper joint, the the left hand notes and keys just fine. And then when you move into the right hand and start moving down the instrument, you start noticing uh, less response, some airiness, some issues. And that's because if this, if this key, if this F-sharp key is being held open, if it's not able to close all the way, you have a leak. And as that air leaks out, it's going to affect everything below that on the instrument. So, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the way to deal with this is to, is to just back off that regulation screw. Um, now, like I said, on, on this instrument, it's it's actually already backed out too far, but I'm just gonna, you know, you would go about say a quarter turn at a time, and then try playing it again. See if the if the right hand notes, if the lower joint response has improved, and and that would be a strong indication that you have you've you've made the right move. Um, and then again, you would want to check check your G sharp to F sharp trill. Make sure that's working. If you've backed it out too far, then that trill isn't going to work. That G sharp isn't going to, uh, excuse me, the F sharp on that trill isn't going to speak properly. So you might have to go back in the opposite direction a little bit. Um, you know, this is this is a way to fix it without bending the key back, which is the ideal fix, the, the proper fix, uh, and what we would do in the shop. But if you're in a situation where you you need it to work now, then you can back that screw out, knowing that the key is bent, but you have a little bit of adjustment there with that screw, get it sorted out, and then when you take it to the shop, they can they can straighten the key out, reset the adjustment, and you'll be in good shape. Um, another thing we see here sometimes is that you're not able to tighten the screw far enough, so, so it just seems like it bottoms out, it stops moving um, before you can get that, that regulation set up properly. And sometimes that's because the arm has been bent up. Sometimes it's because there's a bunch of gunk that's gotten under the head of the screw in there and is preventing it from, from moving as far down this barrel. That's what we call this thing that the screw is actually in. Prevents it from moving as far down as it should in this barrel. Uh, and the fix there is just to take the screw completely out and inspect it. See if there's like a ring of stuff there under the head. If there is, you can sort of chip it off, peel it off. And then reinstall the screw uh, and see if, if the problem has been in mitigated. Obviously, you're going to be, you know, you need to know a little bit about regulating because you're going to be starting from scratch, putting that key or putting that screw back in. You have no reference for where it was before. So, um, you know, before you do that, just make sure you're comfortable with regulation on your instrument. Um, another regulation uh, we'd only see on, on intermediate professional level instruments is with the resonance key, which is this key on the side of the lower joint, <clears throat> opens when you play fork def, first and third finger, and then closes, you can see it there, closes when your, your middle finger comes down, so if you're playing D uh, or anything below it. Um, the mechanism here will depend on, on the maker of your instrument, uh, whether that key stands open or closed when it's at rest. Closed is more common, this is a Luray. Um, this key is, is closed when it's at rest, and then it doesn't open until we play that fork def. Um, so if you notice that uh, anything below D 
is sort of fuzzy or, or not responding properly might be an indication that this regulation, uh, excuse me, this resonance key isn't closing all the way. And uh, I'll back it off a little bit so you can see what that looks like. The way I would check that is I would uh, hold down all three of the mainline keys here, one, two, three, like I was playing a D, and then tap on the resonance key and see, you can see that there's a little bit of motion there. So this, this key isn't sealing, it's not closing all the way. You can hear it and you can see it. So uh, in this case, the usually the screw to adjust that, you can see there's three regulation screws here. We wanna make sure we're turning the right one. Usually it's gonna be the screw that's closest to the pad cup, closest to the actual pad on that resonance key. So, so that would be this screw. So, and to turn that in, eh, there we go. And then check again, hold down those three keys. I don't know if you can, there's still a little bit of motion there. I don't know if you can see that. So we turn it a little further. Just a tiny little bit. You can, sometimes you can hear it more than see it. So that's pretty good. In the shop, we would check that with a feeler gauge, a piece of very thin material that we would drag between the, the pad and the tone hole to see if if there's drag, if, it, if there's resistance. Um, so this actually needs to go a little further. That's what the feeler gauge is telling me. This is, uh, this material is a half of a thousandth of an inch thick. So five ten thousandths of an inch. Um, so, you know, it, it has a great deal of sensitivity in telling me if, if there's a gap between the pad and the tone hole of more than five ten thousandths of an inch, I won't feel any drag. So it tells me you know, with with a reasonable degree of precision where there is and is not a leak. <clears throat> so that's a resonance key. Needs to be closing when when uh, when all of these keys are down. Um, like I said, it, you know, it, the mechanism is sometimes different, especially on English horns, because there's there's more space. Um, but that that's sort of the fundamentals of that. Uh, sticking on the lower joint here. <clears throat> uh, this is another common one on student level instruments, which would be that uh, as they play, they play a C sharp and then release it and the instrument just keeps playing C sharp. The, the keys don't return. Um, or maybe you're trying to do this kind of fancy little, this C to C sharp trill, uh, or you know as much of a trill as it can be. And that C sharp key stays open so essentially you're just holding a c sharp the whole time um, as you're trying to play between c and c sharp um, first place to check if you if you experience that problem is the spring here for the c sharp key and i, I hope you can see that <clears throat> so this is there we go this is the spring that returns the c sharp key to its position um, so if I take that spring off and then I press the C-sharp key, the key stays open. <clears throat> that spring is what closes it. So make sure that spring is hooked. And then if the spring is hooked and you're still experiencing a problem, what we'll often see is that the, it, the problem is actually with the E-flat touch piece here. Because the C sharp and E flat touch pieces ride on the same rod, they're they're on the same mechanism. If this, if a, a certain you know, if an overzealous uh, elementary or middle schooler really cranks down on this E flat touch piece, they can bend the key, and the rod that runs through here will get kinked on uh, in in the in the tube here. So what that means is that because the C sharp mechanism runs through that rod, runs through that, excuse me, runs through that tube. The C-sharp mechanism runs, there's two pieces here and here that are screwed to the rod, and that rod runs through this tube. If this tube is kinked and grabbing the rod, then the C-sharp mechanism can't move properly. So um, the fix for that is only if you feel comfortable doing this, you would place your thumb under the E-flat touch piece there and flex up on it. And 
mm, I'd say better than 50% of the time, doing that will be enough to straighten this key out a little bit, release that tension, that kink that's holding the rod, and then the C-sharp mechanism will be able to, to operate properly again. Um, on, uh, on student nobles that don't have screws on that rod, <coughs> This is a, an old Selmer, uh, 1492. So same, the, the mechanism is you know, theoretically the same. The C-sharp and E-flat touch pieces are on the same rod, but there's no screws holding the C-sharp uh, mechanism to the rod. It's just all floating there. So this could be bent, and the mechanism would continue to work, it's, which is kind of an advantage. Um, <clears throat> something probably most commonly see that issue on Fox, like intermediate level oboes, because they um, they have a mechanism like this where the parts of the C-sharp mechanism are, are physically attached to that rod with screws. Um, they are often in the hands of uh, younger kids who might not have the, the finesse uh, to know when they're, when they're bending something. Um, and because the key fitting uh, on Fox instruments is, is relatively close, or relatively tight, which is a good thing, but it can, it can leave it vulnerable to that specific problem. So, um, you know, if you have a student who encounters that and you just want to give it that, that a shot, just flexing up on it, obviously you don't want to crank on it, but, you know, more often than not, I would say that is a, that is a solution that works. Um, okay, just a, a couple other little, you know, repair diagnoses things to talk about. Um, if you are encountering an issue where the these two small keys on the upper joint are being held open, like we said earlier, they are controlled by the bridge key here. Okay. And so um, the, there needs to be a gap here between the upper and lower bridge keys so that, uh, so that this mechanism isn't being held open isn't being propped up and, and holding those keys open. So you can see there's a little bit of play there. Uh, and that is something we want. We don't want too close a connection there. And the same thing on the bridge, uh, excuse me, on the trill bridge. This one doesn't have quite as much play in it, but there's still a little bit. So um, so again, if you find that, uh, the, the symptom of that would be that your bees if you're playing just one finger B, it kind of comes out sort of as a C, or it sounds really airy. And then that A here comes out as B flat, or, or sort of a half B flat kind of thing. Um, but then that everything below that feels okay. Uh, that would that could be just because these these two small keys are being held open just a little bit by that bridge mechanism. Uh, another thing to keep an eye on there is the condition of the corks here. Um, if these corks become loose, then, you know, the corners of them can kind of fold over and, and create problems. They can take up that space and it might not always be immediately apparent uh, that that's an issue. So just, you know, monitor, keep an eye on the condition of those bridge corks. On student level instruments, they are constantly getting torn and falling off. They're, they're really frequently in bad shape. So um, just something to keep an eye on. Um, same thing is true with the uh, the bell bridge key. Uh, oh, I gotta go with the bell. There it is. So you also want a gap in the bell bridge key, which is. So this instrument has a screw uh, as part of that mechanism, but you can see there's a little gap between the, the upper bridge and the screw. That ensures that this resonance key isn't being held open, um, that it's able to completely seal. So that's a, that's a little spiel on bridge keys. Uh, just one other, one other common issue I want to talk about is this. Um, it's with the C key. <coughs> and specifically this upper post that holds the C key onto the instrument. Um, and, and without getting too deep into the weeds about it, the, the spring that comes out of, of this post, the spring that moves the C key up and down, 
can have a tendency to move this post to over a long period of time, often many years, to sort of unscrew that post a little bit. And if that happens, then uh, it sort of shifts the position of the key, right? If the post moves, instead of being this in this line, the key might now be in this line. So it can affect, to some extent, the seal of the pad here. Uh, and if it turns far enough, it can actually bind up the key. It can, it can prevent it from being able to move up and down smoothly. Um, the, the, the fix for that <clears throat> is, uh, you know, I don't really have a quick way for you to, to resolve that issue, except that you can try to turn the key back, um, you know, by, by, if you see that this post is turned, you can sort of push on the key back in the right direction to turn the post back to where it should be. And it'll usually hold temporarily, maybe only for a day, an hour, um, might last longer. But uh, the, the correct fix for that is that a technician will go in and somehow affix that post in place. <clears throat> um, this is, uh, this is uh, that, that English horn lower joint I had earlier. And uh, there's kind of a lot going on here. But this is that, that post, that C key post. And in order to stop it from turning, we put this lock nut in here. So there's a little like sliver taken out of the post, a little bite taken out of the post, and then this lock, this lock uh, ring fits perfectly into that into that little bite, so that now the post can't turn. It can't uh, it can't move side to side, um, you know. And if we for some reason had to remove that post, we would have to take out this lock ring first and then unscrew the post. Um, you can see that because there's three posts in very close proximity here, it's actually locking all three of these posts, um, which isn't completely necessary. This is really the one we're worried about, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a little lock ring there. So um, those, are, those are kind of the repair things I had to talk about. Um, if, if there are people with questions, um, Someone said, how do you make sure the F resonance key is not over-tightened? Um, which is a great question. You would, if the, so the question is, if, if this screw is tightened too far, and, you know, the F resonance key will be held closed, but the, the issue then becomes that this key, the middle finger key, uh, what I'd call the E key, won't be able to close all the way. So you would pretty you would pretty clearly notice that anything below E uh, would start to sound airy and resistant because you have a big leak there under the E key. Um, so if you're if you are sort of fiddling with that adjustment and you feel that you all of a sudden feel that the the instrument is not responsive below E, then that would be an indication you might want to back things off. So just to go over that again, if if nothing below D is responding well, you may have to tighten this screw. If nothing below E is responding well, uh, then you may have to loosen it. So it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a, it's a difficult line to, to tow, but, um, but those are, those are sort of some good guidelines for that. Um, uh, I'm just going to take a moment here um, to, to again, just briefly mention the, the tip drawer. Uh, if you feel inclined and you're able to leave a tip, half of it goes to Play on Philly, which is uh, an organization that provides after-school music lessons to kids in the city of Philadelphia free. Um, if you are not inclined to tip, that's totally fine. Um, and if you are in a position where you're your source of income has dropped down or gone away completely, please don't uh, give anything. I, I'd, I'd rather you, you keep that money and use it to keep your instrument maintained when, when the time comes. Uh, but if you're able, uh, it would certainly be very appreciated. Um, <clears throat> any specific recommendations for an instrument that isn't played often? Um, make sure it's stored in a, in a climate-controlled environment. Um, so, you know, don't let it get too hot, get too cool. Um, make sure, check, take it out every now and then, make sure that uh, the, the keys are still moving, that the oil hasn't dried out from the mechanism. If you feel inclined to oil the keys, like we talked about earlier, 
you can do that. Just you know, wipe it off really well before you put it back in the case. Um, if the instrument has any felt pads on it, uh, we didn't really talk about pads at all, but um, felt pads would be you know a traditional pad like this. Uh, you know, it has a cardboard back, it's felt, uh, and then there's skin wrapped over it, as opposed to a cork pad, um, which are common, uh, almost universal on uh, on higher end oboes. Um, this is a cork pad. Cork pads are more expensive. They're they're harder to install, but they last for a really long time and they're very reliable. But uh, if the instrument has felt pads, especially um, You'll most commonly see them on the bottom keys here, on the B, the C, and the B flat on the bell. Um, they, the felt in those pads uh, is, uh, is an environment uh, for pad mites, uh, or carpet beetles is what they're actually called. We call them pad mites. Um, but they're little bugs that eat wool. And since the felt in, inside the pad is made of wool, um, it's, it's a very attractive meal for them. So. Um, not uncommon to see on an instrument that has sat for a really long time, like, you know, maybe decades, uh, is that pad mites will get in there, they'll eat the pads, eat the felt out of the pads, and then, you know, obviously those pads have to be replaced. We usually recommend replacing the case uh, because uh, sometimes they lay eggs. Not often, but sometimes. So just to be safe, usually recommend replacing the case. Um, but, you know, that just something to keep an eye out for. Um, is that and you know otherwise yeah just you know keep it uh, your oboe wants to live in the same sort of conditions as you live so um, you know don't keep it in the attic unless I don't know unless that's where you like to live or the basement maybe that's your thing but uh, um, you know just just keep it comfortable um, so that is that's sort of the uh, the information I have um, if you want to see the tools again there's that that octave remover. Um, these are the sort of baseline screwdrivers that I recommend to people. They're made by a company called Weha in Germany. You can get a set of these for like $25, $30 on, um, on line or you know if you if you can go to your local hardware store and spend some money there I'm sure they'd appreciate that. Um, good to have on hand. The, the tips are nice and hard so they don't chip out. Uh, if you have a a Loray oboe and you have that tiny little screwdriver that goes in the case it's great if you have like baby size hands um, these are just a, these are a little more comfortable you can get a little more torque on them um, and uh, yeah so um, like I said if, if there are any more questions I am happy to answer them I'm not seeing uh, any come up for at the moment I'm gonna vamp for a few seconds since there's a little bit of delay so if anybody else uh, has anything they want to ask, please do. Um, but uh, otherwise, that's, that's kind of everything I have. So thank you for, for being here, for watching. Um, if you're a repair school student who was uh, sent here, thanks for stopping by. Um, I, uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to learn about that. I know the students at Red Wing, which is where I went to repair school in Minnesota, started on oboe yesterday online. I am sure that is... Uh, that has been challenging in a way. Um, if you, uh, oh, hey, there's my email. If you have any further questions, if you, if you want to ask, you can email me. That's my address, John at KeystoneMusicRepair.com. Uh, looks like somebody's typing a question, so I'll, I'll, I'll be kind of vamp for another second. Um, just gonna uh, return to Chrome here. Um, if you're interested, I have a blog. Uh, I update it extremely infrequently, like once or twice a year, but it's where I write about bigger projects that I do. Um, <clears throat> the link for it is at the bottom of the video description here, so you can check that out if you feel inclined. Uh, Bandinstrumentrepair.blogspot.com is the address. Uh, and I have an Instagram that I update somewhat more frequently. Uh, Swedge Antilles, that's a uh, that's my little mascot here, who you might have seen at the beginning of the presentation. Um, follow me if you feel inclined, if you like seeing pictures of musical instruments in various states of disassembly and or cats. Uh, I have a cat named Mose who helps me out in the shop, so sometimes he's here um, and he gets featured on there. But uh, Swedge Antilles, it's a stupid name. 
but uh, um, the link to that is also in the description for this video down at the bottom. Um, there's also a link to uh, NAPERT, the National Association of Professional Band Instrument Repair Technicians, uh, which is our professional association and educational organization. If you're looking for a technician in your area, they have a tech locator that, uh, that you can check out and, um, and find a, a, a NAPERT member in your area. So um, that is pretty much everything I have. Oh, which top joint is easier to maintain in case of a crack? A regular one or the one with the polymer sleeve inside? Uh, the polymer sleeve ones are less likely uh, to leak because that polymer sleeve on the inside of the joint, um, you know, if you get a crack in the wood, it's, it's rare that it would continue through that polymer sleeve. So um, <clears throat> um, if, if it does crack, what we would typically do is just fill the crack in the wood up top. Um, and as long as everything is sealing, that polymer sleeve sort of protects the the bore of the instrument from any leaks, which is which is sort of the advantage of it. That's um, you know that's why they they're not cheap to have, but but they are absolutely advantageous. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't see any more questions. Uh, I again want to thank you for for stopping by, and uh, this video will be archived at this exact same address. If you or anyone else you know wants to come back and check it out again later, but. Uh, there's, uh, there's Swedge, he's going to say bye. And, uh, and I'm going to say bye too. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I look forward to any other questions you might have uh, coming into my email inbox in the near future. Bye-bye.